Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Hello and welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I am your host, Terry Hales. I am a certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach. I love talking about all things religion and all things that help us heal from religion. And today's topic, and honestly, the topics for the next little bit, are really going to be about recovering our sense of self and really feeling good in our bodies again. Last week was all about self-trust. This week is really all about self-compassion. And before we get started, I wish I could bring you here into the room with me. I have pages upon pages upon pages of notes on this topic. I'll be drawing heavily from Kristen Neff and Christopher Germer's work. They are the leading experts on self-compassion here in the United States, and they have so much good information to share with us. And also in my work, I know from my own personal life and with coaching my clients that when we can root into a compassionate place for ourselves, when we can empathize, when we can validate ourselves, when we can comfort ourselves, when we can protect ourselves, and when we can motivate ourselves in times of hardship, we become more resilient we become more optimistic, we become happier and more joyful, we are better able to empathize with others, we're better able to be willing to make mistakes, but also to own our mistakes and to make amends for them. Something else that I love because so much of my research that I'm doing and so much of my work and the tools I'm creating are for codependent relationships, particularly with narcissists, I love knowing that self-compassion is negatively correlated with narcissism. And it's negatively correlated with depression and anxiety, which are things that we really struggle with. We either struggle with narcissism. I know I did a little bit when I was in high demand religion. The longer I was in, the more narcissistic I was becoming. And so that's been something I've been having to undo in my own life. I noticed that patterns that were passed down to me where I had been codependent and I had been the person that had gone into the caretaking role for the person who was a narcissist, that I was slowly becoming the narcissist and demanding that my kids and my husband and people in my life fill that void for me. And so I think Whenever we're lacking self-worth, narcissism is something that we can definitely fall into. We all have narcissistic tendencies, but over time when we're lacking self-worth, when we're lacking self-compassion, we can ask other people to fill our vessel. We can become very self-absorbed in some ways. I definitely did, and several of my clients have noticed that they too have kind of started to create those patterns or have been in those patterns for a while. On the flip side, people who are dealing with narcissists or dealing with abuse patterns, sometimes we subvert our own needs and we become people pleasers or perfectionists in order to fill other people's cups and to fill their quotas of self-worth and to validate them, hoping in turn that we'll get our needs met. And so we create these cycles. And one of the things that's coming up in my research is that self-compassion helps us undo these cycles. 
for ourselves. We can't ever force anyone else to get out of their cycle, but we can heal ourselves as we are compassionate with ourselves, as we are compassionate with our humanity, as we're compassionate with our imperfection, as we're compassionate with and comforting to the fact that life sometimes doesn't go the way we want it to go. And sometimes we don't get what we want to get. When we're there for ourselves, the way a good friend would be, we can fill those needs for validation, fill those needs for comfort. We can really anchor into a sense of self-worth and worthiness even when things are not going well. And when that happens, we're able to separate ourselves from codependency and separate ourselves from narcissistic patterns. It becomes a lot easier to heal those things as we root into self-compassion in particular. Something else that a lot of my clients deal with is depression or anxiety. When we leave religion, there are a lot of indoctrinated fear messages that can really lead to a lot of anxiety after leaving. You know, fear of going to hell, the fear of being wrong, the fear of what other people will think, the fear of making a mistake. All of these things can can lead to a lot of anxiety after leaving and self-compassion is a way for us to break that cycle as well with depression often that is shame-based depression often comes from a place of i'm not enough and we get several of those messages in high demand religions as well that we have a sinful nature that we are wretched beings that we can't trust ourselves that We are carnal, lustful, evil at our very center. And it can really lead to some depressive episodes. And so self-compassion is one of the things that we can do for ourselves that can really help us get out of these patterns that can plague us even after we leave the high demand religion atmosphere. So I'm excited to dive into self-compassion, to talk about what it is. We'll be sifting through all of these pages of notes so that I can deliver to you the absolute gems that I've mined over the past several months, but particularly this week as I've been putting together all of my thoughts. So buckle up. We're going to have so much fun with this. And honestly, as we work through self-compassion, I really think you're going to start seeing a positive change. Now, like all things, remember, it took us years to get to where we are. We've been conditioned for years to do things a certain way. We have emotional muscle memory that makes us want to do things the way we've always done things. And as we try new things, remember, it takes time to develop new habits. It takes time to rewrite our neural pathways. It takes time to get into the habits of doing things in a new way. So be very self-compassionate with yourself as we learn more about self-compassion and as we learn how to become really good friends for ourselves as we go through hard things. And I know if you're listening to this podcast, either you are in the midst of going through probably one of the most difficult things you've ever gone through in life, or you are on the tail end of that. Know that this can be something that can really help you through that journey and help you stay healthy and sane and really grow and be optimistic and move through this experience with more ease than you might otherwise. All right, so what is self-compassion? We've already sort of touched on it. Self-compassion is the ability to provide support and comfort and care to ourselves when we are in stress. Pure and simple, it is the ability to be a friend to ourselves when things are maybe not going the way we hoped that they would go. Kristen Neff says, we can't always get what we want. We can't always be who we want to be. When this reality is denied or resisted, suffering rises in the form of stress, frustration, and self-criticism. When this reality is accepted with benevolence, however, we generate positive emotions of kindness and care that we can cope. So, okay, let's go back to the very beginning of my faith transition. All right. I think as we're transitioning out of our faith, I think a lot of times we have this vision of who we're going to be and how we're going to handle things. For most of us, we want to remain this 
cool, collected person that people can trust and feel safe around. We want to maintain our relationships with the people that were in the church with us. We want to be free to explore things. We don't want to, we want to shed the shame. We want to shed the fear. We want to be free to just be the full expression of ourselves. And we almost have, at least I did, had this sunny disposition of, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do this better than anyone else has ever done it before. But maybe that's just my perfectionism talking. But I thought to myself, I'm going to leave the church, but I'm going to do it in a way where everyone feels safe and I feel calm and happy. And you might be laughing at this point because if you've gone through this, you understand that there's grief involved. I mean, we go through huge shifts, right? Huge transitions, not just, it's not just a shift of what we believe, it's a shift of who we can trust. It's a shift of community, of isolation sometimes. It's a shift of self-identity and figuring out who we actually are at our core. It's undoing trauma. It might involve calling into question marriage relationships or even parenting relationships. It is a huge, huge life change. Everything changes. It is a radical seismic shift in what we believe. And so all of this is going on. And sometimes we react in ways that don't really reflect who we want to be. I definitely had moments where I was angry, sarcastic, resentful. And sometimes other people don't react in ways that we feel like they should. Sometimes we don't get what we want. Sometimes our families don't react with the compassion and empathy we hope they would. Sometimes our friends don't ask us anything at all about our faith transition. Sometimes we're left alone. Sometimes people talk about us behind our backs. Sometimes people say hurtful or insensitive things without even realizing how hurtful and insensitive they are. You know, and sometimes people just, they distance themselves because they don't know what to say and it creates awkwardness. Sometimes we just don't get what we want or what we feel like we deserve or what should happen. And sometimes we don't react in ways that we had envisioned that we would. When we can accept that we're human, when we can accept that life isn't perfect and we are not perfect and that that's okay. When we can accept that this whole experience of being alive on this planet, in this body, is going to be a messy one, then we're able to move forward with more positive emotions, I should say. We're able to move forward with more positive emotions towards ourselves and more kindness and care and empathy. When we can't accept that we're imperfect, when we can't accept that we are messy and worthy in that messiness, when we can't accept that sometimes we don't get what we want or what we think we should have, then that is often where we get into that stress and frustration and self-criticism. Understanding that all humans suffer, that the very definition of being human means that we're mortal, we're vulnerable, we're imperfect, and self-compassion really just involves recognizing the suffering and personal inadequacy, that those are just part of the shared human experience, that it's just something we go through rather than something that just happens to me alone. So when we think that the hard things that we're going through are just something unfair that happens to us, or when we think that our ways of showing up in the world that we don't like are just a failing that we experience, we're a lot harder on ourselves. However, when we can show up with kindness, when we can be mindful instead of identifying with our thoughts, And when we can recognize our common humanity versus thinking that we're the only one that experiences this or we're the only one with these quote unquote failings, we can comfort ourselves in a way that helps us be more resilient. It helps us have higher self-esteem. It helps us be stronger in the face of trauma. It helps us have more caring relationships with others. 
and it leads to less narcissism and less reactive anger. Let's talk first about self-kindness versus self-judgment. Often what I'll counsel my clients to do is when we're talking about self-kindness, particularly when it's something that they're highly ashamed of, is I will have them write down what happened and what they feel on a piece of paper. You guys know I love writing. And then I'll have them think about what they would tell a friend if a friend was experiencing the same thing. What would be the advice we would give a friend? We wouldn't tell a friend like, oh, well, of course he broke up with you because you're ugly and old and you have a lot of wrinkles. In fact, he probably took one look at your gray hairs right there in your part and took off for the horizon looking for a woman that was younger and more interesting and all of those things. We would never in a million years when a friend came to us and said, I just broke up with somebody I thought I was going to be with for the rest of my life. We would never launch into telling them that they're fat or ugly or old or that their personality was boring or that they are inadequate in any way, shape, or form and that that's the reason the man or the woman took off. We would never do that. We would be an awful friend if we did that. That person would probably never trust us with anything again and likely wouldn't want to talk to us again. We would be considered an unsafe person. But how many of us launch into that kind of judgment talk when we mess up or when something happens that disappoints us? Suddenly we look at ourselves and we say, well, obviously that happened because you're deficient in this way, this way, this way, and this way. And of course, no one would want you because of blah, blah, blah. So often we get into self-judgment and we criticize ourselves rather than show compassion and kindness the way we would show it to a friend. So when we talk about self-kindness, self-compassion is talking to ourselves the way we would talk to a friend, comforting ourselves the way we would comfort a friend or a child, understanding our vulnerability, validating our emotions, really protecting this beautiful human that we are and being there for ourselves. When something awful happened, I noticed back when I was first diagnosed with clinical depression, so 11 years ago, something bad would happen and I would feel bad about it. But after a few hours to a few days, I would feel really, really terrible about it. And my therapist had me really sit and listen to the thoughts I was telling myself. And so often I was making something that was a heartbreaking situation even worse with self-betrayal and with self-judgment. So what would happen is I would feel sad about some loss or some mistake or something that would happen, but then I would take it and I would criticize and I would judge. And now it wasn't just about losing a client or it wasn't just about yelling at my kids or it wasn't just about forgetting to do something I said I would do. Now it was also about the fact that I was lazy and people hated me and it was about you know, being ugly or old or insufficient or whatever else I was telling myself. It now wasn't just the mistake I made. Now it was the mistake I made coupled with I'm not good enough. And it felt terrible. And that is what happens whenever we go into the self-judgment. So if you notice yourself whenever you have a loss or whenever something goes wrong, feeling bad in the moment, but then over time feeling worse, chances are you are using self-criticism and self-judgment, maybe even subconsciously, and it's on repeat, and you're just feeling not only bad about the mistake or about the shortcoming or about the loss, but you're also feeling incredibly attacked by your own subconscious. You're feeling betrayed by yourself. So notice when you're having those feelings and give yourself some time to sit down and get curious. What's going on? What have I been thinking lately? What are the thoughts going on in my mind? And really get curious and allow those subconscious thoughts to bubble to the top where you can address them consciously. The second thing is mindfulness over identification with the thoughts. So mindfulness is just the ability to step back and observe things with curiosity. Instead of identifying with the thought, we have so many thoughts throughout the day. A lot of them are not voluntary 
And just because we think it doesn't mean it identifies us or that we have to hold on to the thought. We can have all kinds of thoughts that we can just release. I know that there have been times where I've had thoughts, particularly earlier in my adult life, where I had thoughts about killing myself. And I wouldn't put together a plan, but I would have a thought of what would it be like to crash this car or what would it be like if I did this thing or that thing. Learning, we can have those thoughts, but we don't have to identify with the thoughts. We can get curious with them for sure. Why in the world did I have that thought? What sparked that? For sure, get curious. But just because we have a thought doesn't mean it's us. So we can have a thought of, you know, I suck at math. And it doesn't mean that we suck at math. We can actually take a step back and look at it and say, well, that's an interesting thought. What spurred that? Is it true? Do I have evidence that this is a true statement in my life? Or do I have evidence that this is false? What are What is all the evidence that it's false? What's all the evidence that it's true? We can get curious with things. They are just things. They're just objects. They are just ideas that float into our head, and just because they float into our head doesn't mean we have to accept them. Mindfulness is the ability to just notice the thoughts and either release them or get curious about them if we feel like there's more information for us there. The third thing is common humanity versus isolation. How many times have we gone through something hard and thought, I am the only person who knows how this feels. No one else has gone through this but me. I am alone. I am isolated. Everyone else has their stuff together. Common humanity understands that while my experiences may be very individual to me, everyone suffers. Everyone has disappointment. Everyone fails sometimes. It is the common human experience that we're going to suffer and that we're going to be personally inadequate sometimes, that there are going to be times that we wished we would have shown up in a different way or that we wish we had certain skills or that we wish we had a certain set of physical characteristics, but we don't. And when we understand that all of us have things like this, all of us struggle, All of us have grief. All of us experience pain. All of us experience heartbreak. And all of us have this feeling sometimes that we're inadequate. When we can understand that, we can be more compassionate with ourselves because, of course, we feel bad sometimes. Of course, we struggle sometimes. Of course, we get angry or we do things that aren't in alignment with our values sometimes. When we know that this is a common human experience, we're able to give ourselves more compassion because we are not deficient in some way. We are simply human and being human is beautiful. It is messy, but it is beautiful to be human. It's our complexities and it's what makes us tick and it's our emotions and it's our quirks that make us so unique. Right now, if you were to ask my husband what's one of the things that drives him craziest, it would probably be that I leave writing pens everywhere, all over the house. I mean, I'm looking right here. I'm in my closet, you guys, because the acoustics are best in here. But I'm looking and I have five pens that are visible in my closet. I know there's a couple on my bathtub. I know there's at least half a dozen on my desk. They multiply around me. It drives him bonkers because there are pens everywhere. And yet, when I pass away, one of the things he'll miss most is that the pens don't multiply. I guarantee it. It is our quirks. It's the things that make us so uniquely us, that make us so beautiful. And often that beauty is found in the mess. That beauty is found also in our genius and in our superpowers and in our magic, but it's also found in the mess. There is no one else like me. There is no one else like you. And it's all of it that makes us us. So understanding that we all have common humanity, both the good and the bad, and we're not isolated in that. We are connected in that. It is 
part of the human experience allows us to give ourselves kindness. Now, I know one of the big things for me whenever I started learning about self-compassion was that somehow this was going to make me a victim and make me like wallow in self-pity. So if you're in that camp, welcome to the club. I was there. And this is what I've learned about self-compassion. So self-compassion is not self-pity. It's actually the antidote to self-pity. So while self-pity says, oh, poor me, self-compassion realizes that life is hard for everyone. Self-pity tells us we're the only one and things should be different and that the world owes us. Self-compassion says this is life and this is difficult and everyone experiences this. And you'll survive it just like other people do too. I'm here for you and I hear you and I know this is painful. How can I support you as you move through this? So there's no wallowing. There's no, I can't move forward. No one understands. You know, what's coming to mind is the song from The Lion King. I'm actually seeing Zazu in my head where he's like, nobody knows the troubles I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. That is what we're feeling whenever we're experiencing self-pity. And self-compassion says everyone has experienced trouble and everyone knows what it feels like to feel sorrow. And you can be supported because while no one may have gone through the exact same experience you have, everyone knows that feeling. And let's find you someone compassionate. Let's start with ourselves and let's give ourselves that compassion and validation. And then if we need it, let's find someone else that knows this feeling and can validate it as well. Let's ask for support. Let's ask for help. Let's ask for understanding. And we're able to identify those people who can hold us in these really vulnerable spots. And we're able to surround ourselves with people who are safe when we're in these places. That can be part of the self-care and the self-compassion is validating that we deserve to take up space, we deserve support, we deserve for someone to hear our story, and we deserve to be validated in that story. We deserve to be held and loved in our humanity. So that is something that's coming up for me is it is not self-pity to feel self-compassion. It is the antidote to it because it connects us back to our humanity. And it connects us back to one another. Self-compassion is the antithesis of self-pity. It allows us to move through that victimized state and into a place of empowerment. All right, so what's going on in the brain? I think in a past episode, I talked about Mike McCargue or Science Mike on his podcast and how he talks about how our brain is layered. So in our evolutionary process, we had a reptilian brain. And the reptilian brain is mostly involved with things like survival, food, shelter, sex, those kinds of things. It gives us the fight or flight response, and it goes online very quickly. It is our fastest brain. It's the fastest part of our brain. The next layer that wraps around that is our mammalian brain, and our mammalian brain is a little slower than our reptilian brain, but it's involved with connection and with tribalism and with belonging and with comfort. It's what causes us to hold our babies with such tenderness. It's what causes us to cry with a friend. It's what allows us to empathize is this mammalian brain. And then on top of that is our human brain. And our human brain is the calculating part that looks at the cost versus the reward. It also is what allows us to analyze ourselves, right? To look at our own brain and analyze it and to have this conversation at all. And it is the slowest of the three parts of our brain. And so what happens when our self-concept is threatened is we often go into self-criticism. I've had several clients that explain that sometimes they're vulnerable to protect themselves. And maybe you know what I'm talking about. If you're the person that talks about your weaknesses and flaws first, then if other people notice them, it doesn't feel quite as painful. Or maybe that's just the thinking, right? If I own them first, then no one else can hurt me because I've already hurt myself first by putting it out there. And it can be a way of taking control of that sense of vulnerability and that sense of humanity. 
And we develop this way of criticizing ourselves whenever we feel like our self-concept is under assault. So self-criticism comes from the reptilian brain as a threat defense system. Self-criticism is often our first reaction because remember, our reptilian brain acts the fastest. We feel threatened in a situation even if nobody said anything. Let's say we walk into a new room of people and everybody's dressed differently than we are. Maybe we're there. I had an experience when I was, I worked with Rodan and Fields for a few years and my very first meeting with Rodan and Fields, I showed up in what I considered my best clothing or at least what I thought, you know, would be acceptable. And I was in jeans and a cardigan and I walked in and there were ladies in Le Baton heels and they were in their cocktail dresses with their perfectly coiffed hair and their makeup. And anyone who knows me, I can do the whole dress up makeup thing, but I can also do the tomboy thing. I'm like some weird amalgam in the middle. I'm neither womanly woman, but I'm neither complete tomboy. I'm like this strange mixture of a tomboy who likes to get dressed up occasionally. So I'm walking in half tomboy, half girl into this very sophisticated woman presence. And I remember feeling inadequate. I remember feeling underdressed. I remember feeling out of place. And I noticed myself doing exactly what we're talking about here, where I'm the one that made the comments about being underdressed, and I'm the one that made the comments about being a tomboy and being out of place and being awkward. I made the comments first as a way to, it was self-criticism. It was, you know, criticizing myself for being underdressed and voicing all of those things I was hearing in my head as a way to protect myself, because if I noticed it first, then no one else could hurt me with their observations that maybe I didn't quite belong. Now, belonging or not, like I was still able to do some great things. And I loved my experience there because it taught me a lot about leadership. And it taught me a lot about the concepts that we're talking about. I can't tell you how much of the the knowledge I have about self-compassion and self-worth came during my time in in that container and it worked really well for me for a long time but i noticed walking into that room and feeling out of place i was the one saying i feel out of place look at me with my tomboy clothes look at me without makeup i don't know how to do my hair and i was constantly kind of low key putting myself down so that no one else would have anything else to say and maybe that's happened for you too and that is a really quick response because it comes from our reptilian brain. It is a fight, flight, or freeze response. So when our self-concept is threatened and our reptilian brain is turned on, we do one of three things. Either we fight with the self-criticism, like I just explained, or we go into flight, which is isolation, which is we separate ourselves from the rest of the group. We think we're the only ones who feel this way. These are the people you see that, you know, maybe are wallflowers or They separate themselves away from the group. They go sit in the corner. They stand by the buffet. They remove themselves from the group because if they're removed from the group, then they're safe from hearing the criticism at least, right, that they fear might be coming their way. And then the third is freeze. And I have a feeling many people can relate with this one too. Freeze is the thing we do whenever we're talking and we're being ourselves But then later that night, we're going over and over and over and over the situation in our head, and we're frozen in that moment, just going over it and over it and over it. And we can sometimes pair that with the fight response where we're going over it and then criticizing ourselves for that. So be aware of these reptilian brain responses. When you find yourself going into self-criticism, when you find yourself going into isolation, or when you find yourself going into rumination where you're just replaying the tape over and over and over in your head and you are stuck in that moment, just analyzing the heck out of everything. We've all been there and it's a reptilian brain response that is meant to be self-defense against threats against our self-concepts. So just notice this is normal. It's our reptilian brain being online. Compassion, however, including self-compassion, is going to come from our mammalian brain, which means it's going to be a little slower to respond. 
And this is really where mindfulness comes in. When we can learn to detach, when we can learn to spot, oh my gosh, I'm feeling the feelings. My reptilian brain is wanting to come online. And we do that by feeling our emotions, you guys. Our emotions are going to give us a clue every time when we feel like we're in threat. Noticing the emotions and giving ourselves space to step away from the emotion just for a moment to observe, to step away from the thoughts and to get curious before we react. So before we start self-disclosing all of our insecurities to an entire room of beautiful people, before we run away and hide by the buffet, before we start playing over and over again how stupid that thing was that we said, we stop and give our mammalian brain a little bit of a chance to get online by just noticing, I feel shame. I feel anger. I feel lonely. I feel whatever it is. Giving ourselves a chance to just notice and get curious gives us those few seconds. And that's really all it takes is just a few seconds to get the mammalian brain back online. And when the mammalian brain gets back online, that's when we start offering ourselves the the comfort and the compassion and the protection that we need. So we're able to check in with ourselves like a friend. Once we get back online, checking in with ourselves like a friend might look like, hey, are you okay? I mean, think about it. If you saw a friend that was distressed, you would be like, hey, are you okay? And then listening to what you're feeling. Oh my goodness, you must be upset. And then letting yourself know that you are loved and you belong, regardless of how messy your humanity is in the moment. I like to just put my arms, depending on which situation I'm in, I like to put my arms around myself. So for those of you who grew up Mormon, it looks a little like folding your arms, except I'm not like, you know, tucking the hands the way we did. But I will hold my arms like I'm giving myself a hug or hold my stomach like I'm giving myself a hug. And I will say, hey, remember, you're worthy you're loved, and you belong no matter how messy this stuff gets. You get to be completely imperfect and you keep your worthiness no matter what. And I will love you and have your back no matter what happens. I talk to myself in this way. The reason I talk to myself in this way is so often these insecurities are coming from my inner child and I hold my child the way I would hold one of my other children. So if one of my children was feeling this uncomfortable in a situation, I would probably kneel down beside them, pull them off into a quiet corner and say, hey, are you all right? Tell me what's going on. And I would listen and I would hold them and remind them that no matter what, I'm in their corner. There is nothing they could say or do or be that would ever take me out of their corner. And I love my inner child with that same ferocity. There is nothing she could do, say, be, think, feel that makes her not belong and not be loved by me. Does that make sense? So we're arriving at this place where we understand I get to show up completely in my humanity. I get to be completely human with all its complexity and all of its mess. And there is nothing, there is nothing that would take that away from me. I will always love and belong to myself. I will always be in my corner. And you do that the way you would do it for a good friend or for your beloved or for your child. And then the last thing we do is we ask, how can I help? What do you need? To feel better right now? What do you need to feel safe? What do you need to feel secure being human and being completely you? And I give those things to myself the same way I would give to my child or to my friend or to my husband. What do you need? And believing that you're worthy of receiving it just like your child is worthy of receiving or your husband is worthy of receiving. Understanding you are worthy of receiving whatever support and protection you need in the moment to feel safe and to feel validated and to feel seen. Okay, 
before we end this episode, this is going to take a little bit of time, but I really want to go through common myths because one of the biggest things that keeps us from practicing self-compassion is we often have limiting beliefs about what self-compassion is and how it helps or hinders us. So I want to go through four myths with you. And this comes from the research of Dr. Kristen Neff and Dr. Christopher Germer. So let's just like dig into this. The first common myth we have about self-compassion is that it will make us weak and vulnerable. That if we're going around comforting and loving ourselves all the time, that we're going to be these weak, mushy people, that we need to toughen up, right? It kind of comes from this whole like spare the rod, spoil the child kind of a thing. It's this tough love thing that we've been taught. And it's been absolutely disproven scientifically, you guys. In the social sciences, we've found that this tough love, this spare the rod, spoil the child kind of an attitude is actually horrifically detrimental to well-being. So let's throw that one out. The truth is that self-compassion gives us inner strength and courage. It gives us resilience when we're faced with difficulties. Self-compassionate people are better able to cope with tough situations like what we're going through, like faith transitions, like breakups. Because heaven knows when you go through a faith transition, you go through breakups. It might be with friends. It might be with family of origin. It might be just with your faith community and with acquaintances. It might be with your husband. And these are all heartbreaking. They are so difficult to deal with. And self-compassion helps us move through trauma with hope, with optimism, with the understanding that we're going to get through this. Self-compassion actually feeds self-trust. And we talked about how important that was last week. So self-compassion makes us stronger and more resilient because we know that we are lovable and worthy no matter what. That the mistakes that we will inevitably make are just part of the human experience and nothing to be ashamed of. We just learn from them and we move forward. And we're able to hold ourselves as we're growing and learning and shedding things that no longer serve us. Self-compassion is one of the most important things you can do for yourself when you're going through hard situations because it allows you to keep putting one foot in front of the other. Sometimes when the burden feels incredibly heavy. So let's debunk that myth. It isn't tough love you need. It is love, compassion, empathy, kindness, validation. And yes, there's also a masculine piece in there. There, We're going to talk about the yin and the yang. The yin being this feminine part that we're talking about. And the yang, you know, the masculine part of self-compassion being this part that moves us forward. In fact, let's talk about that right now. All right. So... The divine feminine part to self-compassion, or the yin, this comes from Christopher Germer's research, is being with ourselves in a compassionate way, which is comforting, soothing, validating. It's understanding what we're going through and saying it to ourselves in a kind and tender way. I want you to think of a loving mother holding her child. I want you to think of the kind of mother we all long for. It might not be the mother that you had, but it's the mother that we long for. It's the mother that we we idealize, right? This is the yin part of self-compassion. It's holding ourselves. It's comforting ourselves. It's soothing ourselves and validating ourselves. But there's also a divine masculine part to self-compassion, and that is the yang part, and it is acting in the world. So protecting. The yang part of self-compassion helps us set boundaries against people who maybe have hurt us or helps us set boundaries against the harm that we inflict on ourselves. The yang part helps us see where we're being hurt by others or ourselves and to create new behaviors to protect ourselves from further harm. The masculine part also provides. It gives us what we really need. 
So no one can do this as well as we can do this for ourselves. I think so often we look to others to fulfill our needs, but really we are responsible for getting our needs met. And that doesn't mean others aren't involved, but often we have to tell other people what we need. And that involves self-compassion. So it involves sitting with ourselves and saying, what do I need to feel better right now? Do I need someone to hold me? Can I go find someone to do that? Do I need someone to listen to me? Do I need to share my story? How do I get that need met? Do I need sleep? Do I need counseling? Do I need time away from everyone where I can just hear my own thoughts and I don't have to care for people? The masculine part of self-compassion provides us with what we need the way we would provide for someone we love and care about. And the last part of the masculine part of self-compassion is it motivates us. So self-compassion motivates us like a good coach with kindness, support, and understanding, not harsh criticism. I don't know if you've ever been on a team where you had a coach that noticed the amazing things you're doing and then was like, and this next thing, like, we'll get there. It's not quite there yet, but this is how we can get there. That's what we're doing for ourselves. We're not sugarcoating it or pretending like we never make mistakes. Like a good coach, we're noticing what we're doing right at the same time that we're noticing where we're not quite there yet. And we continue to motivate. I know you can do this. I know that you have it in you. You've accomplished all these other things. Look at how much you're doing right. And we're going to get there with this, with practice. So it's so important to understand that self-compassion moves us forward. It's not just comforting, but it moves us towards a better life. Okay, the second myth is that self-compassion is really the same as being self-indulgent. And the truth is it's just the opposite. So compassion inclines us towards long-term health and well-being, not just short-term pleasure. So I want you to think of like a mom in this instance. If a child is crying and is having a really hard time, a mom might allow their child to have a bowl of ice cream, right? In that moment, that might be what feels good. But that mom is not going to allow that child to eat ice cream for dinner every single night for the rest of their life because she cares deeply about this child's health and well-being. And so maybe in this moment, comfort might be a bowl of ice cream or comfort might be, you know, sitting in mom's arms, but she's not going to carry him around for the rest of her life because she understands that walking is also part of his ability to grow and feel independent and feel confident in his abilities. The same thing happens here. When we are self-compassionate, we might give ourselves the comfort we need in the moment, but we also make plans for our long-term health and well-being. In fact, studies have shown that people who engage in self-compassionate behaviors, they engage in more exercising, more eating well, drinking less, and going to the doctor more regularly. These are people who care about their health and well-being. They care about the future. So yes, they may eat the ice cream right now, or they may curl up in a big warm fuzzy blanket and check out for the rest of the day and do whatever they need to do to cry and comfort themselves, but they're also making plans for the long term to keep themselves healthy. All right, myth number three, that self-compassion is really a form of making excuses for bad behavior. Oh, my heavens, you guys. How many of you have been called a victim grieving after your faith transition? I wish you could see my hands. They're both raised. I've been called a victim by so many people simply by being compassionate with myself. And there is this understanding that self-compassion is the same as being self-indulgent or just making excuses for bad behavior, and it is the opposite. So what happens is self-compassion is actually the safety net that allows us to make mistakes rather than needing to blame someone else for them. So self-compassion recognizes your story and allows you to tell it. Self-compassion says, hey, that probably was painful. Self-compassion 
says, your feelings are valid. But guess what self-compassion does that making excuses for bad behavior does not do? Self-compassion recognizes that they're at the steering wheel of your life. Self-compassion understands these things happened and I get to choose what to do with them. I get to decide how I process this and how I move forward for that healthy future that we were just talking about in the past myth. There is a huge difference between being a victim and being shame resilient. Victims broadcast their pain so that they can say, look, see, I have no control over what happens in my life and I'm just a victim of circumstances. I can't move forward. My hands are tied. Shame resilience, aka self compassion, says, Look at this crap that happened. I'm angry. I'm sad. I'm grieving. That makes sense. Here's how I'm going to move through it. Here's how I'm going to work with these things for a healthier future. Being self compassionate is not the same as victimization. You guys can probably hear how passionate I am about this because I can't tell you how many of my clients have had this exact same experience. And then we almost don't want to own our story because we're afraid we're looking like a victim. You guys, owning your story is part of shame resilience. Saying it out loud, recognizing that you have a reason to feel the way you feel, that your feelings are valid gives you the strength and the power to be self-compassionate so you can move through it. Big old difference between victimization and self-compassion. So it says self-compassionate people take greater responsibility for their actions and they're more likely to apologize if they offend someone because self-compassionate people know that they're not awful people when they make mistakes. Self-compassionate people understand that big feelings are part of being human. Self-compassionate people understand that bad things happen and that doesn't necessarily mean that the people involved are bad, that they create harm just like we all do because we're all good people and we're all capable of harming others. We're all capable of mistakes. We're all capable of failure. And when we understand this, we're better able to own up to our mistakes and move through them and apologize and do better in the future. This is a huge one, you guys. If you're working in the racism part of things, if you're working in LGBTQ rights, This is one of the big things we need to work on in society is self-compassion because we are so fragile because we cannot give ourselves compassion. We cannot forgive ourselves. We cannot empathize with ourselves. And when we can't do that for ourselves, we definitely can't do it for other people. Okay, getting off my soapbox with that one. Myth number four, and this one is so important. Self-criticism is an effective motivator. That is a total myth. When we are self-criticizing, we are shaming ourselves. When you tell yourself you're an awful person or no one wants to be friends with you, you are being a huge bully and you are shaming yourself. Now, don't shame yourself for shaming yourself, okay? We're not getting into meta emotions here. I'm just pointing out that when we get into self-criticism, we are not motivating ourselves. Shame is an anti-motivator. When we shame ourselves, we may make ourselves fall in line for the short term, but we also damage our self-worth and we make it less likely that we'll be motivated to make any sort of change. So our self-criticism tends to undermine our self-confidence and it leads to fear of failure. So then we don't want to try anything new and we stay stuck in our patterns. Self-compassionate people still have high personal standards, you guys. There's this idea that if we don't self-criticize, if we don't hold our feet to the fire, that somehow we're going to become these lazy people. But that comes from the limiting belief that we're born lazy, evil, self-serving people, and it's just not true. Humans are born curious and wanting to learn and grow, and we're wired to connect. We're wired to care for each other. We literally evolved this way. Our natural tendency is to learn, to expand, to grow, to be curious, to do things that benefit the tribe, to do things that benefit other people and to connect. 
it goes to crap whenever we start shaming each other. And let's just say this, society is steeped in shame. It is so steeped in shame in the way we teach each other and the way we react to mistakes and the way we think about humanity. It is so steeped in shame. And so self-compassionate people go back to these original roots where they have high personal standards and they want to do good in the world. And They just don't beat themselves up when they fail. They notice the failure, they take responsibility for the failure, and then they start making plans to move forward because they understand that failure doesn't mean they're a bad person. They understand that that failure isn't evidence of original sin. They understand that that failure isn't evidence that Satan or some evil being has possessed their body. It is simply part of the human experience. All right, I'm looking at these pages and pages of notes. And I think we have covered the most important parts. You guys, self-compassion is going to be a huge key, not just to your recovery, but to the life you dream of living, the life you deserve to live. You deserve to live a full, beautiful, joyful life. You deserve to squeeze and juice every bit of happiness and joy and adventure out of this life that you want. And this is how we do it. We do it with self-compassion. We do it with the ability to understand that we are human and that is beautiful. That we are imperfect and we're worthy. That we are unique, but not in our suffering. That we're supported. That we're seen. Or if we're not seen, that we deserve to be seen. When we can root into feeling compassion and kindness towards ourselves, we magnetize other people to us who can see that worth in us. We magnetize opportunities to us that allow us to go out in the world and shine. And we have the ability to try new things because we're not worried that our failure, which will inevitably come, Mistakes will happen. We will learn from trying something and having it not work. Self-compassion allows us to go out and try things and have them not work until we find the things that do work. And that is how we create the lives that we want. That's how we create the lives we deserve. And I want that for you. And I want it for me. And I want it for my kids and for my husband. I want it for everyone both in the church and out of the church. I want us to feel this kind of love for ourselves. I want us to feel this kind of kindness and this kind of motivation and protection for ourselves. Can you imagine? Just close your eyes with me. Not if you're driving. If you're driving, do not close your eyes. But close your eyes with me if you're someplace safe. And imagine with me if every person you knew knew their inherent worth knew they were valuable, was able to make mistakes and own them and move through them without beating themselves up. How would that change the world? How would just you embracing this change the lives of your kids? What would they learn from you? How would you parent them differently? How would it change your relationship with your spouse? How would that relationship look different? What would happen if we all knew our worth? What would happen if we all knew our value? What would happen if we could embrace that we are good people who also do harm sometimes? What kind of accountability would happen? How would that change the world? And if we weren't afraid to take risks and try new things and possibly make mistakes, what kind of progress would we make as a people, as a world, as a generation? And what legacy would we leave for our kids and for the next generation? (sighs) I can see the vision and it gives me chills. And it's the reason I do the work I do. Because we deserve that kind of existence. We deserve that kind of love and that kind of empathy And that kind of connection. And I will not stop talking about it until we get it. 
and until we are no longer championing messages that are destructive to it. I think that's all that I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining me. Please let me know if you have questions. I love answering your questions. I'll put my email address in the show notes. It's terry at Emancipated Coaching. Shoot those questions to me. I check at least every couple of days. I am highly engaged in a lot of really exciting projects right now that I can't wait to announce to you. They're all in the beginning stages, but just know there are some really delicious things coming down the pipeline, and we will be talking about them here on the um, podcast. And here soon, you'll have the ability to join my newsletter. My website is under construction at this moment, but it's looking beautiful, and I cannot wait for it to go live. So I'll let you know when you can join that newsletter so that you can hear everything that's coming. Until then, keep listening to the podcast. You can check me out on Instagram at Emancipated Molly, Reddit at Emancipated Molly, TikTok, which is new, and I'm getting better with the videos, at Emancipated Terry, or we have a Facebook group that you can join. It's called Emancipate Yourself, where we have lots of great discussions, and we go even more in-depth into the things that we talk about here on the podcast. So if you're finding a lot of value here on the podcast and you would like to explore those things even deeper, make sure you go over to Emancipate Yourself and ask to join the group. And feel free to ask anyone else that you feel is going through a difficult time with faith or is going through faith transition or has religious trauma, send them over there. We're going through all of these things more in depth and I want to help as many people as I can achieve that vision that I just shared with you. It's worth the fight. It's worth the teaching. It's worth the time. And I look forward to interacting with you in all of those different places. And of course, if you ever find that you want more one-on-one support, I would love to talk with you about coaching. Again, message me at my email address. And don't forget to share the podcast with others. The more people that know about these things, the better our world gets, the better our relationships get, the more empathetic and kind our world becomes. And yeah, I think that is it, you guys. This episode was so meaningful to me and I believe in it so much. Everything that I post here, I believe, but this is really the self-trust, the self-compassion, the self-worth, and the self-love. All of these things are keys to getting the lives that we want and that we deserve. All right. Thank you again, and we'll see you next time.